So, um, and uh, really, we just want to have a good time. And um, if you have questions about something, you know, feel free to, to jump in. There's um, this crew right here um, are guys from my development studio. Um, and uh, a combination of uh, different disciplines, which we're going to talk about today, some mechanical engineers, some software engineers. Um, and um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll get right into that. Um, so if you can bring up my presentation, I will get it started. Um, so we're an American manufacturer. And in 2019, we're an American manufacturer that exports 50% of our product all over the world. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about that. Uh, we're the largest manufacturer of pinball machines in the world. We make, we probably, on any given day, we probably have about 90% of the world market in pinball. And uh, we make a diverse collection of games and based on premium brands in various price points. And you see, you see some of the premium brands here. I've thrown up some of the uh, brochures from those particular games. We sell the products through a dealer and distributor network um, to commercial operators, enthusiast collectors, and rec room buyers. So that means that people, probably 50% of our products today go into the home worldwide, and 50% of, of our products are in commercial operations like barcades and bowling alleys and movie theater lobbies. Um, we have really strong licensing relationships because we're a little company. These licensing relationships allow us to broaden our power this is the floor of the Chicago Auto Show in 2014 when they introduced the, uh, it was the 50th anniversary of the new Mustang and we partnered with Ford. And Ford gave us, this is incredibly premium real estate. This is the biggest auto show in the world. So if you can imagine, um, and, um, and I of course was on the floor when this little guy was having his turn with the machine and I just couldn't, I mean it's like I thought, yes, this is why we do what we do. Um, <laughs> So uh, we have all kinds of hardcore fans. Uh, this is um, the, the gentleman with the guitar is Mark Tremonti, uh, previously lead, guitar, lead guitarist of Creed and currently with Alter Bridge. And he was in town last week. He invited me to a show at the Chicago Theater. And, and then he came over the, to the factory and he played some Deadpool pinball. And he invited me backstage and all he wanted to do was talk about pinball. He didn't want to talk about anything else. <laughs> Um, over there, our good friend Ed Robertson, the lead singer of the Bare Naked Ladies, has 25 pinball machines. Also uh, comes to see us all the time. Um, that is um, uh, Gaga and Tony Bennett playing an Aerosmith pinball, Las Vegas backstage. And they posted that photo. We didn't take the photo. They were very proud that they were playing. And then, of course, there's Steven Tyler signing the game for a fan. Um, that's Adam West, the late Adam West and, and, and myself at the Pinball Expo, the year that we did Batman Pinball. The Metallica guys are huge fans. We made them a pinball machine. They put us on their website and they have 30 million visitors a day to their website, which pushed those 30 million visitors a day to our website, which crashed our website for a week and a half. My <laughs> IT guys had no idea what was going on. They thought it was a Russian attack. Um, and then, of course, uh, the late James Gandolfini, who is also a fan with his game. I could show you these, these kinds of pictures. Celebrities are way into pinball. I don't know. There is something in the water, guys that play the guitar and pinball. There is a lot of, you know, a lot of rock and roll guys uh, love pinball. Um, so as I said, we manufacture and ship the product all over the world. That's a game going in the box in the factory. These are labels off our boxes, and you look at that, and you say, I don't know if you can read that, but I'll read it for you. Italy, England, France, Australia, Germany, Norway, Austria, Belgium, China, Denmark, Canada, Spain, I could go on. I've seen Dubai, Russia, you name it. So uh, we're very proud of this. In 2019, you have to think about this. We manufacture the product here. We employ 300 people in our factory. Our extended enterprise of vendors probably employs another 15,000 Americans. Um, the people that make the steel I use, the plastic I use, the wire, the printed circuit boards, all the stuff that goes into our game. And we are exporting half of it. This is the Guangzhou game show two weeks ago in China. 
Um, China is an emerging market for us. China and Brazil are emerging markets for us, markets that we're trying to work. But um, you know, they are discovering for the first time pinball machines. Um, so we, we feel like we're leading a renaissance in pinball. And, and we're acquiring fans from a generation of, uh, of game players that were essentially steeped on virtual games. So today, the largest growing segment of our audience is in their 20s because they're playing a game that they can't play anywhere else. They can't play it on their phones, really. They can play virtual versions. And by the way, there are virtual versions. We have, we have digital partners and we make virtual versions of our games. Um, we do a lot of, we do launch parties, we do a lot of PR events. Uh, we go to CES, uh, the Consumer Electronics Show, not because we sell any product there, but just because we get a lot of press. Because we are different from every other product on the floor at the Consumer Electronics Show. Uh, even though we have, as, as we'll talk about later, state-of-the-art electronics in these games. This is our factory. We have 110,000 square feet uh, behind O'Hare and you should come and visit us. We, we do tours anytime, you don't need a lot of, of notice. You can just call us and stop by and see us build pinball machines. Um, so these are just some random photos. Uh, I walked around the plant. Um, again, premium brands, you know, this is a couple of year old, uh, this is several years ago, we were walk, uh, working on The Walking Dead. Uh, of course, we've done Kiss, and uh, this is a little character called Sparky that is in the Metallica game and you know nothing like uh, a row, you know, a shelf full of Sparkies. All, these, all of this content is designed in my studio. So every, every sculpt, every piece of software, every piece of mechanical engineering, every piece of electrical engineering, every piece of game design comes out of my studio. Uh, we have an accessory business uh, it's sort of like buying BMW accessories from BMW. They plug and play, they won't break your game, they extend the, the play of the game, uh, they are interactive in ways that only we can make them interactive. Um, these are big, huge uh, computer controlled um, milling machines, routers that, that cut the play fields, um, the wood for the play fields, uh, right from our CAD files. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna diverse. That was the company, and now I'm gonna go into the nitty gritty of how we design these games. So I'm gonna show you a little movie. Bear with me. Three, two, one, boom. Everything that's Deadpool is in this game. Weapons and katanas, dinosaurs, little Deadpool, Metal Don, Chimichanga truck. You go to the disco, he travels back in time. Mutants, Sabertooth, Mystique. It's crazy with ninjas. And we've got Deadpool narrating it all. Oh, hello! Welcome to my game. I am Deadpool. It's based on the character uh, Deadpool from the comic book. The popularity of the character got so great in, in the world that uh, he's ready for his own pinball machine. Deadpool is the kind of character that the irreverence of the character lends itself to having some fun. That's what I'm talking about. I love Deadpool, and historically, he's done everything. And so there's his life, his loves, his foes, the insanity inside his head. You know, that all gave us freedom to create this big mix of stuff. You know, music, visuals, the pixel art, the 80s sounds. <laughs> Every game design you talk to, I think, I will tell you that, you know, it's all about easy to learn, hard to master. I wanted simple toys, simple ball interactive stuff, and I hadn't really done a game where I was very focused on the flow of the play field or the shots for a while. And so in Deadpool, I did that. Deadpool's got a lot of interesting ideas put into it. You've got different shots you've never seen. You've got a really interactive toy right in the middle. And you've got this shot on the left flipper, it shoots the right side of the play field to feed a side ramp. The ball gets whipped around this wire form up this side ramp and it actually crosses through the play field, unguided by anything, into the ninja lock. 
is a very satisfying shot. It's, it's not easy, but when you make it, it, it's like, oh man, that's awesome. It's little Deadpool time. The little Deadpool bash toy is, is, is a lot of fun just to, to interact with him by hitting him, and he's like, hey, cut it out. Woo! You can knock the targets down and hit a little bit pool. And then it'll lock the ball for you behind the three bay. And you have a hurry up timer where you find it, release it again, and then it starts the multi ball for you. The very first time I had springs on the katana, a bunch of guys walked in and there was no voice, there was nothing. I just shot it and he wiggled and all these guys cracked up and I was like, okay, I'm going somewhere here. <laughs> Part of the feature of the alien premium is the lift ramp that allows you to divert the ball back to the right flipper to continue shooting these disco loops. Then you've activated this mode where Dasser is fighting vampires and it activates the mirror ball. There's like all kinds of flow all over the place. You can keep the ball going as long as you make the shot. It's very energetic and uh, intense. <laughs> When we sit down to make these things, now that we've got the LCD display, we have to decide, you know, what, what are we doing and, and what fits. We decided to come up with, you know, 1990 trapped in a video game temple. Basically, they created a video game in, in addition to the, the pinball machine that we're making because, you know, we had to have stuff that by design is supposed to look like 90s pixel art from, you know, the fighting game all the time. Fighting's limitations are what drove the look of those games. Limited color palettes, smoothing out uh, shapes and things like that. And now we have like 3D characters and then we shoot them through a pixel pipeline. And we'll have, you know, 30 frame punches and we actually had to throw away all of it to get it down to the purest essence of what, you know, a punch is a 3D frame thing, you know. Eliminated 3 out of 4 frames of animation and now you nailed it. Anytime you go into a battle or a quest in the game, you're actually going to see a video game being played that reacts completely to the way you play the game. Battle is lit at the scoop. You choose who you're going to fight against, and then they, they start fighting. Battle. When you make shots, Deadpool is hitting Sabretooth, and he's taking himself down. And then you have this opportunity to make a final shot that's going to cash out a bunch of points. And then you make that shot, and it's a big... Knockout! Deadpool wins! The fun part to me is looking at these things and thinking, what should they sound like? Every switch and every button on the play code has to have a sound. So there are over 70 pieces of music in the game, and then over 300 sound effects, and over 3,000 speech calls. <laughs> it's not that big of a deal. There's some funny sounds on Deadpool, and there's some classic pinball sounds in there, too. Very chunky, low bit kind of stuff and it's mixed in also with, with music. There are four original songs that have vocals that were written specifically for the game. Uh, there's a rap song, a country song, um, a metal song, and an R&B song. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about Deadpool, baby. This is, I'm Deadpool, I'm a cool guy, I'm gonna make this mixtape for myself. And it's, it's all music about me. <laughs> so it's a really interesting mix of stuff, but it all works really well. It's actually one big piece of art. Let me put it this way. I think it's it's been a work of art for each one of us in each of our respective mediums. Deadpool, it's zany, it's crazy, and the ball's wild. I think it's got punch. It's loud-mouthed in your face. You'll really enjoy it. I think it's going to be classic, and nobody else will ever attempt to do this <laughs> because it'd be crazy. That's Deadpool that Pinball. That was awesome! So, um, that was that Bill Pinball. I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm the chief creative officer for the company. I run the product development studio. All the product development efforts for the company are my responsibility. So I have a bunch of design teams 
uh, that are each all working on games simultaneously. The, the teams are staggered. We introduced three new titles a year. Um, and this was a situation where <clears throat> we got into trouble and uh, the designer that was working on the game couldn't continue and so I had to jump in and design the game and uh, I decided that I couldn't take over someone else's stuff I had to do it my way from scratch and it wasn't pretty because I, I have running the running product development is a full-time job designing a game is a full-time job so it was kind of a tough year but we're very very happy with the way that the game came out so uh, let's go on, and I'll, I'll tell you more about the design teams. Uh, sorry, we, I seem to have gone back to, to go on, but I'll get us there quickly. All right, so everybody loves a hero, but the reality is that these things are made by teams, right? There's some old photos from throughout time while I was designing different games. That's actually the Batmobile here on LaSalle Street when they were shooting the Dark Knight movie, because I did the Dark Knight pinball machine back then. Um, I did the Transformers one and the Avengers one and so um, I've really been blessed. I'm, I'm an industrial designer by trade and I've, and I've spent my entire career uh, designing entertainment stuff. Uh, so I, um, you know, right out of school I, I designed uh, late 70s, early 80s upright coin operated video games. Um, I was a toy inventor for a consulting firm for about five years. I ran an Xbox and PlayStation uh, video game design team for about nine years of my life. And I designed pinball machines at the old Bally and Williams uh, company and, um, and then eventually landed here at Stern Pinball. So I'm, I'm really very blessed. I spent uh, 40 years designing things that no one needs, uh, <laughs> but they've kept me employed. So uh, the reality is it takes a, a design team. The teams are multidisciplinary. Um, they are led by a game designer. The designer is sort of like a director of a film. He directs the uh, overall vision and direction of the game and uh, tries to keep the team headed in the same direction. Uh, everyone on the team makes a creative contribution. The creative contributions take all sorts of uh, forms, right? Uh, teams work as you would imagine they do, they get into a room, they immerse themselves in the theme, they watch movies or whatever it is it takes, they order pizza, they talk about what they want to do, um, and they start uh, down the path of creating this, uh, this project. Um, the, the games take about 14 months to design, and, um, and so it's a, it's a long, arduous process. Uh, software developers, uh, the lead developer and the game designer are really the creative vision for the game together uh, because they all touch so many pivotal parts of the game that um, they have to be the drivers of all of the content. Um, but there are mechanical engineers that realize um, the vision and the mechanisms and all of the things that it takes to make the games producible, manu manufacturable. Um, the teams work to budgets. They work to financial, real business budgets and they work to time budgets. Um, because at the end of the day, we're privileged to make pinball machines, but we are a business and we have to stay alive. And so we, uh, we do introduce some element of reality into the process of creativity. That's the real world. Uh, we have, uh, you saw in the film, you saw sound designers, animators, pro, you know, there's a, an illustrator uh, that creates all the beautiful static art. We have uh, sculptors, um, um, our mod, all of our modern day sculptors are digital sculptors, uh, incredibly talented guys. Uh, this is a shot in the studio. Um, those little cards on the wall each represent a task. And those lines are essentially the, the status of that card, the task being done. So the teams meet on a regular basis, especially as, as the project gets closer to the end. Uh, when, when we're about uh, two to three months out from ship, they start meeting every day uh, around the game. Uh, they, we call them dailies, and they, everyone plays the game, everyone critiques the game. Everyone can talk about any portion of the game and everyone takes something away from that meeting. It happens every day. That's how we drive the games to the end. Uh, this is my mechanical engineer, Rob Blakeman. Uh, when we were working on Deadpool, 
I just gave him I just gave him this little sketch and we went you know went in the model shop and cut some stuff up and 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 got it working. And that's my CAD my CAD model uh, on the play field and that's the um, you know it really is like we're making a video game at the same time we're making a pinball machine. That is the three dimensional uh, CAD model of Deadpool that was used to animate all the character Deadpools that. We decided that uh, whenever Deadpool was broke the fourth wall, he was going to be ultra high res, and whenever he wasn't, uh, he was going to be very low res, chunky, um, looked like a '90s video game. We storyboard everything because that's how you get everybody on the same page. Um, so rather than guys running off and making stuff, you really need to understand what you're making. So we storyboard a lot of the scenes, a lot of the things that are gonna happen in the game. Um, some concept sketches on the character. Um, and look at this guy's art. I mean, this is all hand-drawn stuff. This is not, you know, this is not anything but. Uh, this guy's Nam the Gare is Zombie Yeti. His, name, his real name is Jeremy Packer. He's an incredibly talented illustrator. He's so talented that the creator of, Rob, of, of Deadpool, Rob Liefeld, who created the character in the 90s, uh, saw our art and called him up and said, oh my god, you, you knocked it out of the park. Um, so we make uh, different price points. This is, what, this is um, our, what we call our pro model. This is what you're more, more than likely to see on the street. It's a lower, lower cost product uh, than some of the other ones. This is our premium model. This has all the play features on a play field, the same software, et cetera as our limited editions, but it's intended, it's, it's not made in limited quantities. And so this is sort of the hardcore players game. This is what our avid fans, aficionados uh, buy. Uh, and then this is the limited edition. This is made in limited quantities. You get a number, you know, you get number 26 of 500. No one else will have number 26 of 500. Signed by the game designer, et cetera, et cetera. It's got, basically it's, it's, um, it's got a bunch of, it's got a lot of cosmetic stuff. And it's and it's collectible. These, by the way, sell out. Like uh, I mean, that's a, that's so that's a eighty-five hundred dollar game, and they sell they sometimes sell out in less than an hour. Uh, we've had them sell out in fifteen minutes. That's what my desk looked like at the end of Deadpool. <laughs> um, and that's um, and that guy I was talking about uh, the artist. Uh, when we were all done, he, he gave me this giant Deadpool action figure. That's the day he gave it to me in my office. Um, and then, you know, again, I love, I get these from fans, right? I get these from people all the time. You know, here's, here, here's uh, you know, look at this little guy. I mean, <laughs> like, I don't know if he has any idea what he's doing, but it's uh, <laughs> um, this, so this is interesting. This is an interesting segue into what you can do today if you want to. Um, if you want to just play pinball, you can. This this guy is ten ten and a half years old. He's autistic. He didn't talk until he was four and a half. And I got this letter uh, with his drawings from his uh, parents, and they said he plays everything pinball. He just is absolutely crazy about it, and he. And he made these drawings, which um, are, I'm going to frame. But um, and so there's, there's, um, you may not recognize it, but there is, there's real design here. Like this little guy really thought into what he was doing, and why he was doing the things that, that that he was doing. So um, of course we sent him all kinds of stuff to encourage him. Um, I sent him some of my. Um, you know, real drawings and, and, and stuff, and I, I sent him, we sent him a whole box of stuff, and uh, his parents were thrilled, um, and, and, you know, I, but I, the fact, they were thrilled that, they, that we responded, I, I was blown away the way that when I got this, I mean, I was just like, wow, look at this guy, he's just like, he's in it, he's, you know, he might really be one of these guys designing pinball machines one day. Um, all right, so it starts with a theme, right? And, and I like to think of, well, like I drive the teams to, you know, it's, it's fairly obvious. And, and of course, we work with premium brands. We work with premium brands because it's, it extends our power to do that. 
Um, but we have, we used to live in an era where a lot of pinball machines were designed with original themes. And original themes are really tough to do today. Um, and they're tough from a business standpoint. Um, you know, when you call the distributor in Europe and you say, hey, I've got the new game, and, he, and you tell him the theme of the game, and he, the very first words out of his mouth is, what is that? I've, I've not heard of it. Is it a movie? Is it, what is it? And, and then he said, you say, say, no, it's like one of the guys in the studio came up with this, you know, it's a guy and a girl, and they steal a car, and they drive across the country, and he, and he says, why don't you send me two? And, and, you know, had we said, hey, I've got Iron Man, he would have said, oh, great, send me uh, four containers. So the difference is, you know, I'm going to write you a check for a million bucks, or I'm going to write you a check for $16,000. So uh, original themes, unfortunately, because of the, the way the world has gone, where everything is licensed, are not financially viable for us today. And so we have to work with great brands. Um, so you know, it's not a stretch, right? Action, adventure, music, humor, some interesting character, something that you can build a game around. Um, I like to tell the teams, give me a two sentence description of what this thing is. I don't know what it is, but I want to think into it. Assemble the rebels, destroy the, uh, and destroy the Death Star. John Williams music plays, Darth Vader speaks, TIE fighters and next wings dogfight. Done. It's, I got it. You got, you got me. Okay, that's good. Let's go. Um, two sentence description tells us what the game is about. Experience Deadpool's insanity from inside his head. Deal with his foes, his loves, travel through time. Got megalodons, vampires, and yes, a T-Rex. Done. Let's do it. Right? Two sentence description tells you what your game's about. It's 1964, old school play field, nine Beatles songs. Wait, what? Nine Beatles songs. We have nine Beatles songs in that thing. Do you have any idea how expensive that license is? <laughs> so, and then of course we've got, you know, ladies and gentlemen, meet the, meet the Beatles. We have all that, we have a lot of that black and white footage like caught into our stuff, you know, if you, if you get a chance to play the game. It's, so uh, this was interesting. You know why there are nine songs, not eight? We originally thought we can only afford eight. And then, you know, the, every game gets 100% license or approval. And so that means the licensor, they can say no to anything. And, uh, and every iota of content that you create gets approved. And when you're talking about the Beatles, you know, you first talk to the licensing agent, and then you talk to the people at Apple, and, and then twice a year, the principals meet to understand what, what's been approved or not approved. And of course, they have ultra veto power. And George Harrison's widow said, there isn't a George song in the game. Oh, I guess we need nine songs. <laughs> and oh, yeah, and oh, yeah, you, you got to pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we t so what I'm what I'm where I'm going here is I'm I've we've got a very short period of time I have this is really complex stuff I'm trying to like distill it down to a few things right so we talked about themes and now we're going to talk about features is there an iconic toy based on the thing that you are creating is there a thing that that is significant right. Wow, a T-Rex that eats the ball. Um, let's blow up the Death Star. Let's make you try to let's try to make you feel like Luke in the trench. You know, you gotta make the one shot that's gonna destroy the Death Star. Um, a spinning record has a magnet in the middle. You know, in 1964 someone would have said Fab Gear. <laughs> yes, Harrison. <laughs> so um, What I want you to look at is, there's the Death Star. The Death Star is protected by drop targets. Drop targets is a historic, historically iconic device in a pinball machine. And, um, and so what happens, the great thing about a drop target is that you instantly get a sort of a change of state feedback. Uh, so you, know, you, hit the, you hit the thing with the ball and it went down, so that's good. Um, so, Three drop targets guarding the entrance to the, uh, to the Death Star. And the way this, this works is, remember what I said, right? Luke in the trench, make the one shot. So the way this works is take down those three 
drop targets which had TIE fighter icons and I feed you a multiball. And, you, and now all of a sudden you're in the scene where every, everything's attacking the Death Star. Every shot you make is like blowing up a gun turret or destroying a TIE fighter, etc. And there's all this action. But now you've drained, there's four balls in the game, you've drained three of your multi-ball, you have one ball left. And then I start a timer and I start strobing those lights up the ramp because you're Luke in the trench. You've got to make one shot to destroy the Death Star. And I need to bring the element of suspense, which is my timer counting down. Got to get control of the ball. Got to get the ball on the flipper. Got to make the shot. And if you don't, it's OK. You're back to everything goes back to normal, and you're just playing pinball. <laughs> So um, a little bit, in a, in a couple of minutes, we're going to talk about game progression. You know, the evolution of your path through the game, right? And so I do this a lot. That every designer has signatures. I, you know, because it's like anything else, anyone designs, right? So I guard my significant toy. I make you work. First of all, I want you to look inside. I want you to see the Hulk. And I want you to wonder, how do I play with the Hulk? What do I got to do to get to the Hulk? That's curb appeal, right? That's from across the room. You saw the Hulk on the back glass. And, and that drew you to the game. That's the movie poster. It's supposed to communicate some amount about what it is. It's supposed to make you recognize. It's the reason we pay for these big brands. So that from across the room, I can draw you to the game. But now you've got to look under the glass. Now you look under the glass, and I have to entice you with something. And I want you to look at the Hulk. So you say, how do I get to the Hulk? Well, there are four drop targets in front of them that spell Hulk. Guess what has to happen before you can play with the Hulk? You've got to take down those drop targets. And now the Hulk will come alive. He will throw that ramp in front of him over his head. He will pound the play field with his arms. He will sh shake left and right. He will make fun of you actually he makes fun of you and 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 now you now you got something right now i'm entertaining you hopefully so it starts with a theme and you and the way i do it is i think about the theme and then i i i, I go to the features because the features are architectural footprints that i have to accommodate so i have to accommodate some physical device and in order for me to do that, I have to understand what the device is. That's why I do theme, then features. Then I get into the playfield architecture. Right? The playfield architecture is the game. But at the, end of the, at the end of the day, at its most basic, pinball is a bat and ball game. Just like baseball, just like tennis, it's, you, it's that the trajectory of the ball is determined by where it is on the flipper when you flip. So it's a ball and bat game, and it's that simple. So the layout and the, and, and the play field architecture controls. I have devices like pop bumpers and, and what we call slingshots, those triangular islands down at the bottom. Those are randomizers, right? Those are things that I, I, we put in there very cleverly to try to, because the reality is that the first rule of pinball is keep the ball in play. Games must have rules. If, it, if a game doesn't have a rules, it's not a game. And the first rule is keep the ball in play. If you drain three of those, you're out of the game. You're not in the game anymore. So you've got to keep the ball in play. Those randomizers challenge you to do that. They, they, they challenge you to gain control to, you know, I mean, some of these guys back here can actually they can play the game the way I envision the game is played in my head because they're amazing, right? You know, Dangerous Jack over here, you know, he's like, watch him play. It's unbelievable, right? I mean, um, you know, he's, you know, Twitch Guide to the Stars. That's Jack, right? And, um, and you know, he, um, he I, I, I watch and I, I don't, you know, he, he basically was like, and then I will do this, and then I will do that, and then I will do that. Right? I'm not that good. I, I fight to get control of the ball. I, you know, I think about my shot, you know, all this stuff. So I think that 
that, that's the other thing you have to learn as a game designer is I have to entertain the novice and I have to entertain Jack. And, and the, the, the challenge of entertaining the novice is that the novice is going to do what the novice is going to do. He's not doing what I envision he's going to do. He's not going to go, you know, I'm, I'm blinking the light. That's supposed to tell you to go shoot that thing. And he's just like happy to be in the game. <laughs> so, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about rules and game progression, right? And so again, think about what I think about the order, right? So we did we did the theme, we did the features because they define architecture. Then we then we did the play field. We started worrying about making the shots feel great and can I hook up two shots together and what happens when the ball goes over there? Every, everything the ball does when it's on a play field, you should try to anticipate from the standpoint of the good things and the bad things. Because it is a piece of entertainment. And I, it's not about making you mad. It's about making you happy and entertained. So, but there is, you know, like all things in life, all good things have some element of risk. And that's it. So the rules in the game progression are next. And why are they next? Well. When you lay out the architecture and define the features, to some extent, you are creating the rules. If I tell you that you have to take down the Hulk drop targets, I've essentially created a rule. I, I've said, you know, this won't happen unless this happens. And so this, these groups of progression, look at the things that it says, right? I don't know if you can read these signs, but one says drop targets, start Death Star multiball. That's a rule. Assemble the rebels to increase the, the, the Death Star value. What does that mean? That means that until I can go blow up the Death Star right away. If I, I can start the game, go blow up the Death Star. But if I collect the rebels before I attempt to blow up the Death Star, the value I get for destroying the Death Star is going to be that much greater. Um, so uh, at the top over there, a really simple thing, really really uh, dumb, complete top lanes to start double scoring mode. For 30 seconds, you get double scoring. Anything you do is twice, what, twice the value. Right? Those are simple rules. Completing the, the lanes just means get the ball through those all three lanes lit. Um, so again, you, know, you look at right over on the, on the force targets on the, on the left side there, that's a classic pinball spell out. That's what we call it when you, you, know, you hit the target once and you light, light F. Hit it again, like O. Hit it next time, R. So basically, light force, and that enables rebel shots. Every shot has an icon of a rebel on it. And, and guess what? That's the rebel shot. That's, the outside ones have a picture of Luke. Those are Luke's shots. The two inner Luke ones are Leia. There's an R2D2 shot in the center. And there's a Han Solo shot right here in the swoopy ramp. So when I, when I complete those targets, I light one of those guys. When he's lit, you make those shots. You make it some number of times, and you have acquired that character. You've assembled. You've collected him into the assembly of characters. Games are cybernetic. They provide feedback. Right? It's the reason you smile, the reason you laugh, the reason you get upset. It's because something has happened, and it's giving you the feedback to do that. So remember the movie. Remember Jerry Thompson, the sound designer, saying every, every target, everything has a sound, right? And in addition to that, almost everything has a light show or a reaction, or a, it, maybe it's a physical transition, a transformation, something, right? That's, those are the elements of feedback. You feel it. You hear it. Um, you know, I, I, in some cases, we rumble the cabinet, and you can feel it. Um, so this choreography, really, what it does is it brings all the elements, all those other elements together. And, and it's a thing that you know, happens very late in the, in the process, because you need all the elements. All the elements working, all the elements assembled, everything happening. And so and, and this is the. You know, this is the, the responsibility of the software guys, primarily. The game designer can walk in and say, you know, give me a light right here. And, and I, I think that light is late. But my perception of late and his perception of late are very different, right? He's talking about milliseconds of control. 
I'm talking about it just feels wrong. No, nah, that's slow, a pastor. And we sit there and we iterate until we get it right, right? Um, so orchestrating lamp effects, sound, music, video, and fit to physical state changes is the magic that creates the feeling in the games. That's, that's it. I mean, it's like, uh, so they are very, very much, and, and cybernetics is an old word, right? I'm, I'm you know, I, 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 I um, cybernetics is, is from a time, you know, it's like, I don't know what they call it today. But, so I use it, you may, ne may have never heard it, but, you know, basically if the stove is, t it was hot and I touched the stove, I burned my hand and I re reacted, that's a cybernetic interface. Um, I want to show you this, um, which I think conveys some of the things I'm trying to say, and I hope this works. me this this little girl playing at one of the trade shows that guy that was she was playing as one of my guys and he was just watching running the booth and she was literally playing with him meaning that they were both He's low. in the game yeah. this guy not part of the same group there you go. <laughs> So, all right, so let's see here. Is this going to make me go all the way through the end? Yeah. Oh, no, really? <laughs> okay, sorry. So we do all that, right? And is it fun yet? Um, it's really possible to envision all this stuff in, the, in your head and describe it just the way that I did. And when you play it, it's not any fun. So what does it take to make it fun, right? Because now you're uh, 12 months into your development cycle. The manufacturing date is approaching. The you know the program management people are losing their minds you know when the designers are walking around going yeah we can't ship this thing yet it's not any fun and you know the the you know the the designer the, the game designer is getting present it calls from the president of the company you know are well, you guys gonna be ready are you gonna be are you gonna make it and uh, it's not fun yet so unfortunately the only way. And, and so what happens is when you've had a lot of experience like I do, you get closer, but you don't ever, ever conquer it, um, you know, without uh, iterating, right? So what it takes is, what it takes to make it fun is to iterate and iterate and iterate. And iterating means not thinking about it in your office, staring at your computer screen. It doesn't mean thinking about it and talking about it um, those may be elements of it, but iterating means doing 
So making it fun, to make it fun when you don't know what the problem is, means get your hands dirty and do something about it. And it doesn't matter which discipline of all those disciplines that we discuss, whether it's the sound guy, the software guy, the mechanical engineer, the, you know, I mean, there's a play field that's pretty mangled up, right? Look at, look at that, you know. I don't know if you can see those holes, but they were not made by a computer-controlled milling machine. <laughs> they were made by a guy with a, uh, you know, with a drill and, you know, and a lot of pressure because the president of the company is calling, let's go, let's go, we got to ship this thing, right? So um, I don't know another way around it. And I, and I, I design toys, I design video games on, on two distinct different platforms and for two distinct different audiences. And I've designed probably 18 pinball machines in, in the course of my career. And, and in every scenario, uh, how you make it fun is you uh, rip stuff apart, take it, put it back together, move it around, try something else, talk to another guy, go home, think about it, do it again the next day. But if you're not hands on with it and you're not really pushing it with your hands, um, I don't, I, I'm, I, I love my CAD tools, I love all, I love all that state-of-the-art stuff, right? But there's something about touching a piece of material and cutting it or there, that informs you in a way that your CAD system can't inform you. And so that, I am a huge fan of, you know, like cut it up, make it do something. And, and the software guys, I, I watch their iterative process, right? And they put something in and they don't like it and they go back and they take it out and they do it again and they rebuild it and da 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 and that, that back and forth is what it takes. So let's recap, right? Themes set the tone, the features are the toys and some of the challenges, physical challenges. The layout is the play space and the challenges and in essence the game. The rules progression, mark your progress through the game um, and, and basically make it a game. It's not a game if it doesn't have rules. Um, choreography is that very critical feedback element that makes you love or hate something. And it's, it's, it's absolutely um, vital. And in, in my head, this is the order in which they must happen because the one below it depends on the one above it. Um, and then that last bit of magic, right? That the, what is magic? Well, it's iteration, luck, experience, and work. That's what it is. It's 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 just I don't know another way. I don't you know and and uh, I've seen it happen so many times that something that went from you know no fun to amazing uh, and that transition period is it's it's one of the scariest things if you're in product development it's one of the scariest things you'll ever experience. But you got to have faith. You got to you got to you got to give the process the notion of iteration the time to do it um, and, and, then, and then you'll get there um, and, and that's what I got. I, I have, uh, this is a lab and, and a lab means that you know, you're going to do something. So uh, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. You can have fun, you can go play pinball, whatever. But I had this, I had this vision. <laughs> I had this vision that Y'all are gonna break up into teams. And here, I, I brought you a little designer kit. Let me show you what's in your designer kit. So, a brand new box of Crayolas. <laughs> you cannot go wrong with a brand new box of Crayolas. Um, and then of course, we're talking about designing a pinball machine, so I brought you a pinball. Just so you could feel it and touch it and understand it, you know, like my first day as a pinball designer, this is back in the day before CAD, right? We had these big giant drawing tables. And, um, you know, the, at the base of the drawing table, there was like a, there was a trough. And you get your pencils there, and you know, you like, your, all your eraser shavings, you know, would like fall in there. And uh, one of the experienced designers came over to my desk, and I had this big giant drawing, you know, and you know, I, I have respect, right? I mean, I spent 15 years of my career drawing with a pencil, you know, and sharpening it every day and all that. And honestly, we put a man on the moon doing that. So let's, let's not, you know, <laughs> and these young guys, they, they look at me funny when I say that, right? Because they like, they grew up with CAD, you know? They're like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> you know? But um, guy said to me, he goes, 
no, I, I, you got a problem. You're never going to succeed in this business. I said, why? And he goes, you know, you cannot do anything. You can't. You get up right now. Go to the lab. Get a pinball. Put it in that trough. You have to have it there every day. You have to touch it, feel it, move it around, throw it. That's how you design pinball machines. Okay. <laughs> Steve Ritchie. Steve Ritchie. Steve Ritchie, all right, so then I brought you some inserts, right? These are what we call inserts. These, you know, you call them lenses. They're, of course, this is a pop over cap. But and this is like the blade for a, uh, a drop target. And so you're saying to yourself, what am I going to do with these things? So I'm going to say, I'm going to say to you, here's what I would like you to do. So here's a, this is a blank play field. See, it's got flippers, right? And, and like, don't you want to just draw on this? <laughs> You just want to take those Crayolas and have a good time. So let's let's invent. Let's invent the. You know, I think you should break up into groups and invent a thing. Doesn't have to be anything crazy. It can be anything you want. And then I think yeah. that. You know, this is what I think you ought We're to do. Distract. But you wanted half the group to maybe play pinballs first? Yeah, yeah. So I was going to, my, my vision was, I don't know if there are really 40 of you here, but I sort of planned around 40. So I thought that each pinball machine, each pinball machine can take four people. We'll turn them on. Each people, people can play pinball for half an hour, and the other people can design, and then you can switch. But, you know, here's what I thought, right? I thought you take the popover cap and you go like that, where you want the popover, right? And then, you know, you go, okay, I have this, I have a spell out right here, and I'm going to make it like this, and, you know, and I'm going to yeah. say hello. Right. And then I got some lanes coming into the pop on bridge, right? And I thought you would just use these. You would just use these devices to trace these things, right? I want some I want some targets over here. Right? So I think that and then you know whatever, here's your theme insert. So this is what I think you should do with your crayons and your markers. You should just like take those Take the stuff in your designer kit and you know have fun. Make something like this, right? I forgot some ball guides, right? You gotta make some shots. So you gotta, you gotta decide, you know, like a big orbit shot that comes around here like this. It's gonna bring the ball back, right? And then we're gonna do a ramp right here. This is a crazy ramp. A big old snake ramp, right? So I just want you to have fun, right? Like make some stuff if you want. <laughs> Dude, woo! So, do we want to add You want to do a Q and A report? All right, yeah. Q and A. And then um, we're gonna put out some food and beverage now too. So because you're in an arcade, right? We should have some. So help yourself. It'll be out here, and then. Stay back. Okay, we just don't want everyone doing the pinballs at the same time. So yeah, that's that's some designer kits. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> we got a okay, stern staff the, in the back here. I think everyone's going to have them, and then um, so does anyone have a question? Okay, we're going to just throw it out. Are you ready? Anyone? What's the question cue? <laughs> okay, so any questions? I have a question. Okay. Um, okay, I know nothing about pinballs. So okay. I'm going to start by saying like I have never played pinball. So um, I'm talking about the room. But is there anything in a pinball game that's below the surface, that's like secret, that you don't see it, but that's happening in terms of like, there's, if you win, it drops down, you get a bunch of points because something happens in the dark and then it comes back. Right. Up. So we, um, okay, so let me clear up some stuff. We're, we're, we're not a gambling device. So we don't <laughs> purposely try to take your money. <laughs> uh -huh. You could, if you're good at pinball, like Jack, you can play for hours on your quarter, uh, at, on your dollar today. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, um, and it's free today. <laughs> but you can play forever, so we don't take your money. But I, I, would, I will gladly uh, lift the play field, and you guys can see 
like all the craziness that it takes to do the stuff on the top. Please do. Right. Okay, so we'll do that. Uh, can, can, so the, I, the keys are, uh, they're on a, yeah, they're on one of the power, one of the cores. He told me right here, I think. Is it this, is that it? Okay, yeah. So one of, uh, like, um, what, a Jurassic? Yeah. So uh, we're going to lift the play field for you guys, and we're going to show you. And, and, and then afterwards, we'll open up the back box, too. You'll see the whole thing. And then, you know, you can gather around and you'll see the whole thing. Um, any other questions? Yes? If you just want to throw the microphone, so I can hear. Sorry, I'm trying to catch it. So it was really interesting to hear you mention about how much it's tied to um, known brands. Yes. And that is what sells. I'm curious, though, um, if you had conversations about um, something that's not explicitly tied to a brand, but more of like a hobby. Like, does does an NBA team in particular sell much better than basketball in general? So, so I I've actually done an NBA licensed pinball machine. I used all the teams, mm -hmm. um, and and you know we've done. Uh, the, the issue with the issue with brands is, and by the way, um, a title, as we call it, you know, as we refer to a brand, is no guarantee of success. You still have to put a game in it. Uh, you're, you still have to make compelling stuff. You can't just dress anything in anything. Um, that you know, that is just a recipe for disaster. So the idea is to. Think of pinball as a medium, right? It's it's different media, like you know, like a. Uh, think of a guy that makes a film is working in that medium. A guy that makes an oil painting is working in his medium. Pinball is a medium, and the best the best implementation of a pinball machine is one where the theme, the brand is seamlessly integrated so that everything makes sense to the things you're doing, how you're doing it. Um, the, the licensors call it brand equity. You know, don't, don't mess with my brand. You know, make my brand, retain the equity in my brand, be true to my brand. And so like, for example, that Ford game, right? The, the, the president of Ford said to me when he saw them on the floor, he said to me, you know what? That thing looks like we made it. And that, that's great, that's, that's the highest compliment they could have paid us. We took your brand and we applied it to, in our medium and we were successful because you, you think, you know, oh man, look what they did with it. So um, I think you're talking about what I, what, like so the best licenses in my mind are what I call a, a soft license. Soft doesn't mean less powerful. Soft means I have the room to do something creative with it. Deadpool was, Deadpool is a Marvel property, but every creator that has touched Deadpool uh, for a new Deadpool story, for a new Deadpool something, has had some running room to make it his own. And, and that's what people want. That's what our audience wants. Our audience wants the pinball machine to be a unique piece of that element, that brand. And that's what we try to do. Thank you. Thanks, that was fascinating. I, I guess my question is more with the continued explosion of gaming on devices, and obviously the next generation doing it in a different way, maybe the previous generation. How is that impacting the pinball arcade? Right, generally? so so we, um, uh, we've had explosive growth over the course of the last 10 years. We continue to grow. We, we're we're going to have a bigger year this year than we did last year um, because we are you, our medium is unique because uh, I don't have it on my hand. You know, I don't have it on my phone. I have a virtual version of my game on, on the phone. I have a virtual version on my iPad. Um, but there's nothing like that that thing, right? So uh, from our perspective, it, there's it's it's a non-issue. It's like the my the largest growing segment of my population is 20 something it's not you know it's not uh, 42 there I, I do have I do have different elements right I have a guy 
that maybe is 42, who's now doing well, he's got a, he's got a big house, he's got a family, he remembers playing pinball in college, um, he's what we call our rec room buyer, and he's gonna buy one, and if we do our jobs right, you know, he'll buy another one, or he'll trade that one after some amount of time, et cetera. So that's one segment of, of the market, but the, 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 the largest growing segment is um, you know, 20 something because it's a new, different thing. It's unlike anything else they do. Uh, thank you so much. I'm curious, um, and I work in, in advertising, so I'm always trying to, trying to understand the consumer, obviously, here. It's, it's, uh, it's somebody who's playing these awesome uh, pinball games. I'm curious, like, what are the common traits or qualities of these sort of pinball wizards? Wow. Um, well, so it's an incredibly diverse demographic. Um, it's, it's, it is absolutely, um, I mean, I wish I would have had a slide on it. We actually do slides, you know, we do, we have some, we have some presentation, uh, decks in the marketing, on the marketing side that, that address exactly that question. And so like we have, I mean, in, um, nationwide there's a, you know, there's a women's league, women only, called Bells and Chimes. They have a chapter here in Chicago. They get together on a regular basis to play. We have that little girl that you, that you saw on, in the video. She's part of a group called Little Flippers. They're, um, you know, little guy, you know, little, you know, boys and girls, certain age, they play. Um, go to any of the barcades in town on a, uh, you know, on a Thursday or Friday night, and you're going to see a date crowd, a 20-something date crowd. You're going to see, um, you know, so it's, uh, I, can, I can introduce you to lots of people in their 30s and 40s that, uh, you know, with, with collections or, just, you know, there's, there's a guy that, you know, there's a guy, you know, he's got, he lives in an apartment, apartment in Manhattan. He doesn't have the space for 10 of them. He's buying one, and when he gets bored with it, he's flipping it, because one of the things about these things is, unlike any other type of uh, coin-operated product, they have incredible resale value. It is one of our, it is one of the hallmarks of what we do. It's, is you go ahead, buy a pinball machine, operate it for some amount of time, or play it for some amount of time, when you go to get rid of it, it's it's still worth some large percentage of what you paid for it. Um, and so we have a community of people that can't afford to have 10 of them at once, but they can afford to have one. And they'll trade them and get the next new one. Um, so this weekend, if you have the time in Wheeling at the Westin, Pinball Expo is going on. It's a local show. By the way, there are shows in every city, almost every weekend, and tournaments. Go out there, it's not much of an entry. I don't remember where it is. Jack, you remember how much to get into Pinball Expo? There's a group on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but if, if you wanna go out there, if you wanna go out there, you'll, you'll get, uh, you'll get um, um, an idea of uh, this crazy hobby. This morning at the factory we had, you know, like school buses, they, they, they do a tour. We probably had 500 people come through the factory this morning. Um, you know, they, these school buses pull up and these people empty out and we give them tours of the factory and then they get back on the bus and go back to the ball expo. Uh, tomorrow night, Cassandra Peterson, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, will be there at our party because we have just finished the third iteration of an Elvira game. And so, um, and it's got, you know, it, it, she did a bunch of custom video and stuff for us. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, we are a global lifestyle brand that we didn't, we didn't set out to, with the notion of becoming one, but we have become one. Um, anybody else? All right, so, oh. I don't want to throw it. Okay. Oh, I was just gonna say, why Chicago? Is it because of Valley, or why are we yeah. a lucky center? Right, so that, that's a good question. We, um, so, uh, you know, there's a joke in our business that because companies have tried to build pinball machines in other um, other cities, et cetera, and, and they've never survived. They've always gone out of business. So we so we uh, we say it's like uh, yeah, you know, you can yeah, you know, build pinball machines. You got to build them in Chicago. But yes, the the, the history of the business is uh, you know, Godly Valley, 
um, uh, and all of you know Williams and all of those companies uh, were here. And uh, there was a um, uh, you know there was a time when when there was another uh, you know we're we're in some you know we're in a renaissance and we're driving. Right? We set out to, to proactively grow our company. Uh, we came out of the ashes of the crash of 08, and we've been on a growth spurt ever since. Um, but it's it's like when people say to me, "Wow, pinball!" Like I, I mean, who knew? And I like, well, you know, I knew. I think we've been. You know, we're, we're like the guys behind the scenes driving this thing. You know, <laughs> like, like you think it, you think this is like a thing that happened to us, but I, I, you know, I'm here to tell you, we happened to it. <laughs> uh, Yes, uh, I was wondering. Uh, I believe you do the band design, correct? That's more flow based. Uh, what's your opinion on like stop and go design? Oh, I like. You know, I mean, I like. It's uh, so. What he's talking about is um, my my games are designed so that if, if you're Jack Danger, you can actually make one shot, get the ball back on the flipper, make the next shot, get the ball back on the flipper, and transition. So these these transitions these these uh, control transitions are, are called combinations for obvious reasons, or you're combining shots together. And, and my, the, the, the games I grew up playing that influenced me uh, were, were of that sort, and so I design in that style. And he referred to stop and go. There are other designers that basically uh, move the ball from place to place hold it, stop it, give you a chance to react in a more um, controlled way than, than the stuff that I do, which is, you know, is very reactive. Um, uh, there's, there's great, and it's just a, I, I don't, I have nothing against those games. I play those games as much as I play my games. Um, I, it's just a thing I'm comfortable with. It's a, it's a style I'm comfortable with, so that's where I work. I think we should let the fun begin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so Molly, love you, buddy. Invent a theme, tell me what it is, and have fun with the crayons. If you don't want to do that and you just want to play pinball and eat and drink, do that. My guys are around if you actually are going to do something. You know. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, and yeah, we've got a game up here taken apart, so if you want to look at it. I want to see you play Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people are going to wonder. Yeah. I've been waiting for this. So, Internet, how'd you feel about that? Was it good? Yeah? It was good. Have you seen the inside of a pinball machine? I'm sure you have. Hey, this is Wayson. Hi. When Welcome to the Dangerous Jack stream. <laughs> Gomez, thanks, dude. Dangerous Jack. Um... Uh, Monday through Friday. Monday through yeah. Friday. Yeah, if you ever want a tour, you're welcome to email uh, sales at sternpinball.com. Yeah. Sales they, at sternpinball.com. Yeah, and they'll walk you through it. You'll see how every aspect of the sausage is made, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Give them a couple days notice that you wouldn't like a tour, and they'll arrange it for you. Sales at sternpinball.com. Got it. Yeah, buddy. Internet, look, it's the Amber Shooter Rod. It's the uh, patented bat tube <laughs> to hold all the. <laughs> Honestly, I forgot that uh, we even put that in there. That's hilarious. So you're the you're the one. Huh? I am the one. <laughs> Do you do contests and things? Um, I travel the world sort of just showing people how to play. Uh, I compete from time to time, but I usually prefer just like having a beer and just showing people how to get better. Yeah. Yeah. Great fun. Um, I want to say something to you, which is for many decades now, I've had a personal philosophy okay. that you cannot have a bad day in red shoes. And if you do, it would be much worse if they were another color. Okay, that's... Wonderful. I'm, just, I'm giving you that. I mean, thank, I I have a great day every single day, and I think it's because I'm wearing these red shoes. <laughs> Leslie, thank you for that. So what's your best?
background other than playing games? So I was an animator for 18 years, and then a friend when I was so graphic style. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I, I was building out a, a studio in the West Loop, and a buddy of mine dropped off a Lord of the Rings pinball machine because he didn't have room for it, and that sort of just like got me hooked. I didn't give a crap about pinball before that. And now I've been playing for about eight or nine years. I've been trained by the best players in the world, and I've just been spending my time relaying that information back into the into the public. Yeah, that smells delicious, by the way. It is delicious. Is it alcoholic? Yes. I'll be beverage. I'll be right back, my man. Tom? Yeah. Tom. Hold hold that hold that thought. It is. <laughs> so back then we interviewed. Apple pie cocktails. Oh yeah. Oh. Okay. This. Wow. Yeah, the first table we got was Lord of the Rings, but the game that really hooked me was uh, Judge Dredd. Lord of the Rings was my first experience, but Judge Dredd was the game that got us into pinball. Holy F, this is the most delicious tasting thing I've ever tasted. Cauliflower. Nachos. Like, all right, the... Dead flip POV. You got it, internet. Look at that. Stern pinball on the wall. What about your whirlwind experience before that? Oh, I don't. I didn't even like know what the frick pinball. Wa did this hand just move? Oh my god, I did not know the topper moved like this. Is he dictating how well you're doing with a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Kind of is. That's hilarious. Oh no. Well, that's an unnatural hand movement. All right. I was hoping we can ask questions. So, internet, here's what's going to happen. Um, we are going to. What I do? Am I in trouble? Hell yeah, I'll teach you all the tricks. Graham, you're gonna be the best damn pinball player in this room. Uh, as soon as I find a place to put all my stuff. <laughs> all right, internet, you get to stay here and watch people drink and play pinball. Um, but what I was trying to say was, we are here. I'll, I'll sit over here so you can see me. Um, we are going to be doing a series very soon, I just talked to Gomez about this, where we're going to be reaching out to designers and learning their sort of tricks of the trade on how they make games. So Gomez is going to show us how, like, why he's the fastest at making foam core ramps and how he attacks a brand new design when he's making a pinball machine. Um, Eric Minier of uh, JJP. Also, we're going to sit down with him, have a few drinks, and he's going to talk us through it, you know? We'll get Scott Denisi on, Steve Ritchie. We got freaking everybody. So uh, there's a lot of cool content coming. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out if we're going to do it all live, you know? Um, or if we do it where we set this up and then just sort of ignore you guys and then just do our thing. Does that make sense? So uh, we'll see. I don't know. Pat Lawler, absolutely. Yeah, it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be awesome. All right, let's uh, let's go beat some people up on pinball machines, shall we? Should I set the camera up? Let's be the audience without interaction. Hi. Um, probably. Remember when I first met you and I called you Wayson instead of Wayson? That's, yeah, that's because Jody. Yeah. Oh, Wayson. Oh, yeah. Is that? Totally rude and Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's way soon. It's actually, that's actually like more interesting. Way soon? Yeah. <laughs> this is freaking delicious. Is that his viscous tea? No, this is an apple pie alcoholic beverage. Wait, 
Internet, let's go look at some people designing pinball machines real quick, and then we'll uh, we'll tr we'll train people. Internet, should we design a pinball machine? Oh yeah, we we had we had this conversation. I love you. She's awesome. <laughs> oh nice. Tim's giving away some secrets. So. From chat, this is Anacota from uh, from the chat there. What was the name of that cartoon? Invader Zim. Invader Zim. Oh, you don't know Invader Zim? Bro! That's amazing. Can we talk to Tim, please? I mean, he's teaching. He's teaching pinball philosophy. Gorgeous. That's not a tilt. There's a mechanism in there, yeah. the tilt bob, to tell you if it's going to be too much movement, and, and it will stop your game. But just little ones like that, you're usually going to be okay. Yeah, because uh, all of a sudden on Deadpool, all of a sudden all, a second ball came out, so now I'm playing two balls. Oh yeah, there's multi-ball features too. There's you don't want to listen to Tim. You've heard it all before. Blah, blah, blah. I'm a programmer. La di da. How to aim. What I want is some nachos. He allowed to do Lyman one day? Yeah, I don't doubt it. Sorry, just recording people's, uh, the backs of their heads. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got at least the front of Lyman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Internet, I'm going to get some nachos. Hold tight.
Internet, uh, use your Amazon Prime. Just kidding, I'll be right back. Okay, I'm gonna get some nachos. Yeah, this VOD will not be muted. You can go back and watch it. not cool it like fluctuates and flashes and stuff I can upload this to YouTube if you guys want it How was that talk? Did you get a lot out of it, Internet? I always love seeing how uh, the designers' minds work. Cool, that would be hilarious. I would say your best resume to get a job as a designer at Stern is to show up with a pinball machine you built. I'll, uh, Archer with Keith Elwin. Hey, Internet, I would say, um, oh, you're good. All right, go. The amount of people here that are pinheads, I'd say if there was 40 people here, I'd say maybe three of them were active pinball people. I want to go look at Amokata's um, pinball design, what he's doing. Give us some tips. Absolutely. 
You guys okay? I think I gotta shut the stream down in order to uh, pay my parking. Um, this video is gonna be available on YouTube. I'll maybe I'll trim it a little bit. Uh, but thank you all for hanging out tonight. This is a lot of fun. Um, tomorrow we are probably gonna try to stream early in the morning. We're gonna try to stream the crawl game. Okay, one of ten in the world, crawl. All right, bro. And um, I think early also we're gonna play some more Elvira. Okay? All right, I love you all. Thank you so much for all the subs, resubs, donations, everything. Um, we got some really awesome content coming with Gomez, Minier, all these designers. It's gonna be sick, okay? Be good, and uh, I'll see you soon. All right, bye, internet. I would like to hear this.